buses will no longer be running around the clock. We're told service will be cut citywide. City revealed its plans to lay off more than 160 firefighters. So now with one fire station, they will have to cover 24 square miles. Our EMS workers are facing layoffs. They insist there are not enough crews to respond to emergencies. A vacant house turned into a dope Smashed through the front entrance of a Detroit grocery store and we're gone. Long Detroiters long. really want to know, when will the streetlights be working? 91 at 7-Eleven, where people are voicing their opinions with yes or no. And the city in crisis. Detroit bankruptcy could be days away. Because it would be the largest Chapter 9 in U.S. history. We had been reporting this story with a sense of looming inevitability. The writing was pretty much on the wall. The story started to break on the morning of the 18th from the free press. I said, Bill, we have to talk. We had received credible tips that the city of Detroit was preparing to file for bankruptcy. I needed him to confirm the story. If you file that story, that will tip off every litigant against the city to go into court and get a TRO to stop the filing of the bankruptcy from occurring. Once they file for bankruptcy, the bankruptcy code will trump the state constitution. You have now created the vehicle to cut the pensions. We're in an office with every high-ranking editor of the Detroit Free Press, weighing in on whether or not we're going to run the story. Nancy says, appreciate the honesty. Not going to hold the story. Now to the latest on the city in crisis. Detroit city bank leaders are Detroit dealing with protesters. Out. The police and fire board were going, you get up to Lansing this second. Sources tell me that Kevin Orr will be filing a bankruptcy petition in federal court today. Free Press is, is apparently unwilling to kill the story. But I'm hoping that the governor, who is very deliberative, hurries up and gives me the authority so we can file. You're the governor of a state, a large state. You're a white Republican. The city about to teeter into bankruptcy is overwhelmingly Democrat and overwhelmingly African American. You're going to think about that decision. It was a hostile takeover. In Eastern Europe, they would call it a coup. We finally get the letter, so we're all excited. Can we file it? Can, can we file electronically? Filing was so thick, it crashed the system. The wheels start turning in Lansing in court. The litigants are trying to get before the judge. Our attorneys are trying to slow him down. The attorney general's office was representing the governor and the governor's people. This was pretty fast paced. I was on the phone with the assistant attorney general. You, you have to get to the courthouse. We had gotten wind that pension fund of the city was going to try to stop the governor from authorizing the bankruptcy. I packed up the computer and raced over to the courthouse. The plaintiffs brought before me a complaint that pensions were going to go into bankruptcy. This was so enormous. I just thought this was another attack on our Constitution, and I wasn't going to stand for it. We got a hearing that's going to take place at any moment. When the judge walks in, and brings the gavel down, it's, it's over. We're not going to be able to get it done. But I needed to hear the other side to say why there wasn't a violation of the law and the Constitution. The Attorney General needs 15 more minutes. We refile immediately so that we can get in just before the hearing. Said he was walking, said he would be late. The Assistant Attorney General walked over to the courthouse and he indicated he walked over as fast as he could. Because we are all trained in the legal profession for civility. Let's be courteous. I was sitting there on my laptop watching the federal bankruptcy website, refreshing this thing every few minutes. There's rumblings in the back of the courtroom. I looked down, and there was a filing. 
I turned to Ron King and I said, you guys are too late, they just filed bankruptcy. His immediate reaction was, those fuckers. We beat her by a couple minutes. It had been basically played by the attorney general's office, slow walking to the courthouse. By the time he had gotten there, the bankruptcy had already been filed. And, and it was not due to some unethical delay that he slow walked. I was courteous. They lied. I was blissfully unaware of any collusion. It is what it is. They're just bound and determined to run roughshod over any semblance of common courtesy, decorum, playing by the rules. There's no rules. This is it. This is the city's chance to either reset the scales or the city's moving further down the spiral to obsolescence. And all of us knew that. How does the whole city go bankrupt, you know? It was a lot to grasp, I think, for me as an individual, but I, I imagine that for many people around the city, just trying to understand what does this mean? When the bankruptcy was filed, no one knew what that would look like because there just had never been a bankruptcy like this in the history of the United States. It's the biggest bankruptcy, an incredibly poor city. If you'd sold everything we owned in the city of Detroit 33 times, in 2013, you would not have come up with enough money to pay our debts. How did we get to the idea that we couldn't pay our bills? Who did this to Detroit? Because that was a question that I would get all the time. Who did this to Detroit? State, city, county, bond market, federal government, private enterprise. We did this to Detroit. Detroit topped out at 1.8 million people. It was at one time the fourth largest city in America. My father, he's a veteran of a war and cannot vote in the town where he was born. He moves to Detroit, there's opportunity, right? They're not preventing African Americans from voting in the North. Uh, there's discrimination, there's problems, but it is not what he sees every day in, in Natchez, Mississippi. Every African-American in this city can tell you that's everybody's story. Detroit was and is one of the most racially segregated metropolitan areas in the United States. One of the key actors was the federal government. They redlined the metropolitan area. The safe neighborhoods were neighborhoods that were all white. The risky neighborhoods were neighborhoods that had even a single or a handful of African-Americans living there. It was a one-horse town. You know, it wasn't a diversified economy. But there was opportunity, jobs. All this created a very vibrant African-American middle class. Black Bottom and Paradise Valley, you had Black-owned businesses. They, they were doctors. They were lawyers. Black Bottom and Paradise Valley were wiped out. That forced the migration of working-class Black people. This move away from investment in Detroit started in the 1940s. And it was decisions made by white men to build in-city freeways to move people out of the city and build new communities. 200,000 people lost in the 1950s alone. White suburbanites fiercely resisted the modernization and expansion of a transit system that would connect the city and suburbs. Not only have we seen white flight, 
leave Detroit for the last 70 years. We've seen the black middle class leave Detroit, beginning certainly in the 70s and, and into the 80s. My first encounter with Appalachian poverty, isolation drove that poverty, made it impossible for people or their children to get to something better. We started to see that take root in an urban fashion in cities like Detroit. If you wanted something better, you couldn't get to it if you lived in the neighborhood where I was born. Even after the city had added an income tax and a casino tax and a utility tax, our tax base had still gone down by 80%. Over the last several decades, cities like Detroit have lost a lot of financial support from state governments and from the federal government. Republicans, along with Jennifer Granholm, who was the Democratic governor, absolutely killed revenue sharing, which was the primary way that the state helped cities with funding. The city's financial distress led to a disaster in terms of service delivery. The city can't have the buses run on time, it doesn't have the street lights working, it can't deliver services that citizens are paying taxes for and have a right to expect. Detroit also witnessed a, a, a massive wave of tax foreclosures as a result of non-payment of property taxes. This has had a devastating impact in terms of the growing number of abandoned houses and vacant lots in the city of Detroit. Dave Bing became mayor with the premise that as a businessman, I can save the city. The problem that Dave faced is that when he got here, things were too far gone. I could read the balance sheet. <laughs> And uh, it was obvious to me that we were a city that was already bankrupt. The extent to which we had just absolutely abrogated the contract that city government has with its citizens to provide services life-saving services in so many instances, to me, so greatly outweighed almost anything else. The urgency of saving this city from itself on behalf of the people who live here was the only thing that could guide our decision-making. My dad, he worked at Ford Motor Company and he was laid off in the 80s. Once I got to um, the eighth grade, my parents moved me to Southfield to be in a safer neighborhood. So I bought a camera on a whim, started me back into uh, exploring more of the city, places that I hadn't been in since I was a young child. It kind of makes me think about the analogy of a, a frog in a pot. If you boil it slowly, the frog won't notice. And so maybe for some of us, it was sort of a slow boil. The citizens of the state of Michigan have spoken. It is time to reinvent Michigan. Rick Snyder gets elected in 2010. One of the first things he does is create an emergency manager statute. By now, you've got a lot of cities around the state that are having a lot of trouble. Removing the leadership from power is an important part of the backstory for the city's path to bankruptcy. So we created this law that basically said communities can try to fix this on their own. If they don't, we can go in and do a review objectively. It's actually what I call a reptilian law. It has the ability to constrict and contract and to suck the life out of anything that it touches. This is something that's a last resort. It's something that you only do when you're in a terrible financial situation with no options. They make sweeping decisions to drastically change the way the city manages its finances, it's how it provides services, and this is a big deal. This city is going to collapse. We are running out of cash. We have to do something different, profoundly different. I want communities to help themselves, but if they're failing to do that, how do you solve the problem otherwise? Do you just let it keep on going? The emergency manager law arrives to say 
all of this poverty, the sort of crisis of depopulation and disinvestment in the city was a management problem and we can fix it and we was white Michigan. The popularly elected people that you voted for, you don't really care that you voted for them. We're gonna send somebody in. It wasn't about politics. I view this as a moral obligation. The citizens of the state of Michigan put a referendum on the ballot to remove the emergency manager law. We could net together 2.3 million Michiganders that voted down emergency management. I think as an elected official, the last thing that you want to do is to have somebody else come in and, and run your city. But I know we needed help. I mean, it's a really powerful question. Do we even believe in local democracy anymore? And in November of 2012, Michigan voters said it did matter. Governor Snyder put forward a second emergency manager law, making it referendum proof, which means the voters would be unable to go and vote that one down as well. There's nothing in the Constitution that prevented the state from doing what it did in Detroit. In fact, the Constitution gives the state the authority to do it. When you have a set of elected officials, of which I was one, who were unable to provide the basic capacity to protect life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, somebody's got to do it. Because this is where people truly live day to day in their neighborhood with their children, with their schools. When the house is burning, from my vantage point, you don't say, uh, you didn't give me enough time. You've got to react, you've got to act. Bottom line is we can't continue down this path. We had this opportunity to discuss potential representation of the city of Detroit. And so I was on the pitch team, and someone on the panel threw out a question about, does the city need an emergency manager? And I filled it the question. I expect that when I pick up the phone, the police are gonna be here. I expect the murders to be solved. I expect that when the fire is on in my house next door, they're going to put it out. Their debt load is simply unsustainable. By any objective measure, this city is failing. Picking the right person is very, very important. My managing partner, he calls me up. He thinks they found the emergency manager. I said, great, is it somebody we know? He says, yeah, we know him quite well. He says, they wanted to be you. He's a partner at Jones Day. He's not going to leave all that behind for the privilege of moving to Detroit and being subject to death threats every day. This is going to be nuts. Why would I do it? So I went home that night, and I told my wife. She said, you know, you, you run around here every Sunday morning yelling at the talking head shows about, you know, somebody needs to do something. So this is a time for you to put up or shut up. I do think that Kevin uh, was the right guy. As Detroit motto says, we can rise from the ashes. This is a beautiful city and a wonderful state that gave me my start. I feel compelled to do this job. I was worried for Kevin. It's really hard to come into the city in 2013 and really understand the stakes. What people in the city are fearful about. I remember standing there behind the Honorable Councilwoman Joanne Watson. And I remember her turning to me and telling me, you better not cry. 
Whatever you do, don't you drop a tear because the people of Detroit need to see that somebody stood with dignity and truth on their behalf. I marched in that march where Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. first uttered the uh, transformational I Have a Dream speech when I was 12 years old. I was taken to that march by my grandparents. I have a dream this afternoon. One day right here in Detroit, Negroes will be able to buy a house or rent a house anywhere that their money will carry them. They will be able to get a There are a lot of threads in Detroit that lift up social justice and equal rights and organized labor and support for the worker. This idea that poor people should have power and that they should have a seat at the table of power. Union movement sets in and the automobile factories. African Americans attain power um, gradually. The union movement was progressive uh, and very helpful to African Americans, but, but African Americans faced racism even within union organizing. The auto industries uh pivot toward defense and procurement production, largely won the Second World War for America. It could not have happened without that. The term arsenal democracy was coined then. Detroit produced the tanks and the airplanes. There were no civilian cars built for six years. Barry Gordy worked on the assembly line. He took some of that discipline and transferred it to having a, a real a lineup of performers and engineers and stylists and persons who could uh, market uh, the Motown brand around the world. Detroit had the highest median income of any city in America. Thanks to the UAW, the, the car companies paid decently, paid decently for blue collar work. Blacks were very much locked into certain pockets of the city. These barriers that were there in front of them placed a, a great tension between uh, blacks and whites. A lot of those tensions helped to fuel the race riot of 1943, rebellion of 1967. White suburbanites began to see themselves as having nothing in common uh, with um, the increasingly African-American city. Coleman Young gets elected mayor in 1973. The point of maturation of a movement to put black people at the table of decision-making. He says when he wins, I'm bringing everyone with me. That was significant because Black folks were able to exert their power in a very unique way. They used it at the ballot box. African Americans' pride. When you had a black person making those decisions, you felt like not only do you have skin in the game, you got a chance to win. The presence of hubris in the Detroit automobile industry is a, uh, a very powerful, a very sad story, too. It's a corporate oligopoly on one hand and a labor monopoly on the other hand. And they were too busy fighting each other to look up from themselves and see, oh, there's a couple Toyotas coming down the road here. Maybe we ought to keep an eye on those things. The auto industry's contraction from 1960 disappeared hundreds of thousands of jobs and changed the entire character of the city. Everyone in Detroit watched the car company bankruptcies. Um, the car companies and their uh, associated suppliers are by far the largest employers in the whole metro area. And so the Great Recession really was the tide going out. As the car industry goes, so goes Detroit. African Americans in Detroit feel as though they're, they're in some ways being punished for having had the audacity to think they could govern themselves. It's easy to look at the resistance of some Detroiters to the appointment of the emergency manager and say you know, they're not seeing reality, but it also just really doesn't take into account the history of the community, the, the fight that African Americans have had for voting equality that still goes on, and, and what that symbolically means to people who had to face 
abuse, physical abuse, within our lifetimes to be able to vote. So it was controversial, it should have been controversial. It's not a decision anyone should have made lightly. And we've been the beta test. And what we've seen play out should concern the entire nation, that our democracy is already on life support. What is it like to live uh, not in a democracy anymore? Look, it's better than living in hell. Ambulances breaking down. Fire trucks with holes in the tanks. Fire hydrants that did not work. Police cars that did not respond. Had to be done. Just had to be done. Nobody wants a dictator to come into their city and tell them, this is what we're gonna do. And that was a tightrope, a balancing act for Kevin Orr. And before we let you take over our city, we will burn it down first. Shabazz spoke after helping disrupt a crucial meeting of the state finance. I certainly was aware of both the cultural and racial overtones. This guy is coming in here to basically do the bidding of the white man's world. He works for the man. He is the man. Belly of the beast. They show up every day with a bag of Oreo cookies, black on the outside, white on the inside, and paste it on the door and say, I was a sellout. He could tear up union contracts. He could throw everything out the window and rewrite whatever terms he wanted. I had people in City Hall who were coming in and telling my administrative assistant my payroll check bounced. There was no more time. The fault was not that far off. What kind of city would we have? by Detroit, calling on every creditor to accept cuts. Everyone from employees who will see their pension and health care benefits cut to bondholders who will Creditors see from New York are sending people who you've never seen before. So you may be talking to a lawyer for a bond insurer, or you may be talking to some guest at the Westin who has no idea what's going on. Hey, were you in the meeting? What can you tell us? Detroit had an incredibly large number of creditors. It was in the hundreds of thousands. All of their interests were just diametrically opposed, and each of them thought the other ought to be giving up something that they had. If you're going to go broke, you should have a lot of money because it's expensive. You pay lawyers, bankers. Fijic had guaranteed the payment of just north of $1 billion. That made them the single largest creditor in the city, by far. We don't have it, so it has to be adjusted. Oh, hey, pension systems, you got a big problem. You know, you better be thinking about big, big cuts. We'll get used to thinking about pennies on the dollar right now. And we're looking at this going, well, th this is bullshit. We basically ended the meeting by saying, look, you've seen the numbers. You know this isn't sustainable. We are protecting first responders. We are protecting orphans and widows, literally. Knowing what had been promised to all of us, we still felt that our pensions were safe. The average retiree Receiving a pension of $20,000 is not exorbitant. I'm a single mom who's taking care of six people off the income in my household. You can't make that fair. This is a promise that the city made to me. I've done nothing wrong. I've been a 30, 35, 40 year employee of the city. They're not living paycheck to paycheck. They're living paycheck to Tuesday. When you're a financial institution, you manage your risk going in. This is the cost of doing business for them. For pensioners, this is life, death, and health. I expected 
that when I retire, I would receive the benefits that had been promised. So I was very much disturbed, angry, and I wanted to do something about it. Retiree of the city uh, came up to my mother and said, is your son Kevin Orr? I'm a single mother of six, lived in the city all my life. He's going to destroy me, and it could end up killing me, and just went on and on. The woman broke down in tears in front of my mother. So my mother calls me. She's distressed. She's crying. So I start crying. I said, Mom, I, I, I've got to do my job. Our first proposal was a 32 cut. I've seen a lot of opening salvos. That one was pretty pathetic. It wasn't intended ever to be anything, you know, like a meaningful proposal. My mindset was, this is an exercise. And I would never have said that publicly back then, because then you would question our good faith. We did what we could in good faith. There was not good faith negotiations. There was intimidation negotiations. They had taken the position that under state law, their pension rights were constitutionally protected and could not be compromised because it would affect every other pension obligation in the country. Take your pick. There are dozens of municipalities across the country that have the same kinds of financial concerns that uh, Detroit had. My legal team said, Kevin, we're running out of time. And that more than anything eventually made me decide I can no longer negotiate in good faith ad nauseum. We're going to have to file bankruptcy. So anyone who thinks that I wasn't negotiating in good faith when they're suing me, I ask you to look at that context, that your decision, instead of coming to the table with me, is to continually file suits against me. Who's not operating in good faith? You know, does anybody think it's okay to have 40-year-old trees growing through the roofs of dilapidated houses? Does anybody think our children should walk through the streets dark home from school at night in October? Does anybody think that they should call the police and, and not be able to come on time because they're already out on calls? No. We're finally at a point where we simply cannot kick the can down the road any further. I know a lot of people outraged at my appointment, my take. Uh, I wish there had been a lot more outrage over the past 10, 20 years. We must address these issues and restore services to the citizens of the city. On the editorial page at the, at the paper, there's a weighing exercise that, that, that takes place, right? So on one hand, I've got this fear and concern that African Americans are being disenfranchised and uh, told that uh, they can't have elected officials make decisions. On the other hand, we've got this incredible financial hole that's been dug in the city of Detroit and the absolute collapse of city government into that hole. This idea of filing for bankruptcy and saying we've got to hit rock bottom to get to a better place. These aren't trivial decisions. These aren't trivial moments. It's happening at 10 a.m. at Federal Courthouse. This decision will determine whether Detroit can fix its finances under Chapter 9 bankruptcy. It was just a sea of suits in that courtroom. And everybody is rolling in boatloads of paper, binders. They had stacked up on, on the benches. We had the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, wire services, the local media. We were getting readership from all over the world. I mean, this was a massive story. It was hard for some people to accept what was happening. And we knew we had to be able to explain to Detroiters what, what was going on and have them trust us when we told them. We were watching a video monitor with the closed circuit feed coming in. It wasn't going anywhere else but to us. No cameras in the courtroom. So how do I tell the story? Every single constituency demanded, screamed for 100% recovery. Scorched earth from day one, scorched earth. We chose to serve our citizens of Detroit. We should be compensated as it was agreed. We here talking about money, people's livelihood. This is not what you call good faith. I mean, this is more like entrapment. 
Detroit active and retired city workers know this is a key phase and showed up in numbers at federal court. They're facing cuts to their pensions, health care, and jobs. You could just hear the protesters chanting and, and marching in the streets. People who gave their blood, sweat, and tears. We will not allow them and their legacy to go down in shame. We think taking a dime or a dollar from pensions is too much. To do what? To pay the banks off. The banks are considered secured creditors. We're garbage. There are two big elephants in this courtroom, race and democracy. Detroit debt is being used to justify the largest institutionalized and most racist poll tax in American history. I'm a widow. If the bankruptcy were to take my husband's pension away, we would be thrown directly to the welfare rolls. We would just really have to scramble to survive. I want to share with you my experience in Detroit of austerity, or cutbacks as they used to be called. One month ago, a young man was shot dead on my street. <clears throat> For five hours, his body laid on my street. For those five hours, a hundred people came to our street, his family and friends, and they got to see his body lay there for five hours because of the cutbacks for the coroner. This is austerity. Detroit needed to support citizens who had witnessed and experienced violent crime across the city's highest years of homicide. It needed an intervention in kids, like basic sense of bodily safety in the city. We just left Detroit and its people to, to figure it out. Things were so bad in the fire stations, they didn't have alarms. They put the empty pop can on the fax machine. The fax came through, it knocked the pop can on the floor. Fire! I had an interest in Detroit firefighters because a number of my friends uh, were firemen at the time. What I saw was a department that was understaffed, uh, under-resourced, overwhelmed with the sheer volume of fires, you know, many of them arsons. The low point for me, the neighbors just burn night after night. In Detroit, the firemen go in the house. This thing collapsed on uh, my friend Walt Harris. He didn't burn to death. He suffocated because the house fell on him and folded him in half. They have something called a pass alarm. His didn't trigger because it was broken. The city's debt and cash flow insolvency is causing its nearly 700,000 residents to suffer hardship. The court accordingly concludes that under Section 109C, the city of Detroit may be a debtor under Chapter 9 of the Bankruptcy Code. We were promised by the state constitution that our pension would not be diminished or impaired. We were totally in shock, disbelief. What made it not complex was actually the Michigan Constitution itself, because although it says that pension rights may not be impaired, it also says that pension rights are contract rights. In bankruptcy, we impair contract rights day in and day out. We're going to roll over you. We're going to take your health care. You're 70 years old, you can't get another job, well, go die. That's how we retirees felt about it, because that's the way it was. As easy as it was legally for me to come to this conclusion, I had a very strong uh, emotional reaction after I left the courtroom uh, to having told 20,000 pensioners and current employees that their pension rights 
might well be impaired through this process. Kevin told me that, that bankruptcy is, you take the promises you can't make and replace them with promises you can. Every Tuesday or Thursday, I'd ask my detail to take me out so I could get a feel for the city. At that time, school children were still riding city buses. And what caught my eye was a, a little princess of a girl who, uh, who was about the age of my daughter. Um, but she was sitting at a bus stop. And she was sitting there by herself. And it dawned on me that that was her daily routine. That was her day, which really put it in stark relief for me. Yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot of that abandonment. There's a lot of things that, that look and feel negative. But and there are families that are intact in the city. There's business owners that are really working hard, um, not only to, to manage their business, but to support the community. But for many people, it was really almost incomprehensible to hear of a city so large going through something so dramatic. In most cases, when it's Wall Street versus Main Street, it's Wall Street that wins. The, the human suffering that, that a true liquidation of the city would cause. That was what we were looking at, taking a city of 700,000 people and basically wiping out services to the citizens. The bond people and the creditors essentially wanted to liquidate as much of the city as they could. There were assets on the city's balance sheet, assets that could be monetized. Only two of them had any positive value, the water department and the art institute. My client, Fijic, had hundreds of millions in the Detroit sewer water system. Uh, so they, they had a, a very large vested interest. There's a core problem with the system in that the suburbs are paying for the Detroit service. Suburbs felt like they were on the hook paying for problems that Detroit wasn't handling. Water was once one of the most affordable utilities in the city. It was not an issue even for low income. But as uh, time passed, the rates of water started steadfastly increasing. Those water bills were transferred to the taxes. So you had many people losing their homes as a result of the delinquent water bill. It seemed that everything was on the table. Um, and, and that's a scary thing to imagine. They, they would get to a conclusion, but at what cost? There was a lot of concern that there wouldn't be much left once it was over. When a local government is running up against hard fiscal times, it has three things it can do. It can raise new revenues through taxes or fees. It can borrow new money. Or you could find an asset to sell. Kevin and I were meeting, and I said, what's on the horizon that I need from a public relations standpoint to be worried about? And Kevin said, I'm concerned about the art. They bought it with city money. That's no different than if they bought a building. What happened in Detroit and other places is a group of very wealthy individuals with big ambitions for their city decided that their municipality needed the jewel of an art museum. The city was booming, money was everywhere. These individuals were collecting aggressively in the 20s and although they were collecting them for themselves, most if not all of their collections were destined for the Detroit Institute of Arts. During the 1920s, Van Gogh, Matisse, Bruegel, all of these major works are being bought with, in some cases, entirely city funds. Those priceless artworks become assets for the city, and assets can be liquidated, and if you can liquidate an asset to make a creditor whole, you can sell art. Whatever the situation is, no one has the right to sell that collection. I think he was just aghast that any apparently uh, brute 
a Neanderthal would ever think about selling the art. They buy and sell and trade their art all the time. So for them to somehow say it's an asset to them, but not an asset to the city that paid for it is disingenuous. We had our first meetings with the emergency manager's team and uh, learned how severe things were. The museum was really the principal asset that the city owned at that time. And that our sale of art, our loaning of art, or our pledging of art could provide additional revenue for the city. The uh, meeting itself was incredibly chilly. There was one moment the, the emergency manager's lawyer, he said, I don't want to say this. And I sort of thought, hmm. I think you do. There is nothing to stop the emergency manager from firing you, seizing the collection, and selling whatever he wants. Um, cash is king, right? Until I have some cash in hand or a firm proposal or a definitive agreement, everything's on the table. We wanted to make sure they knew that our evaluation of the city required us to do evaluation of the DIA. I was just looking in total disbelief at the notion that you could evaluate 60,000 works of art in a matter of months. We also told them that it would be in everyone's best interest to keep this as quiet as possible. And of course, two days later, they decided to tell the Detroit Free Press and Detroit News that we were coming in like Visigoths to take over the collection. The executive director of the museum says Christie's is welcome to come in just like anyone else. We decided that they could just come into the galleries and they can walk around with their notepads, pay their eight bucks like anybody else, and, uh, and they'll be in the galleries. How dare you go in to you know, appraise an art museum? People can't do things like that. The world blew up. You would think that I've been caught on the loading dock skinning cats alive. And they came back and said, the collection's worth anywhere from 500 to 800 million dollars. If I was being hung in effigy by community activists and labor leaders, there were an equal number of angry art patrons who were, who is this guy? It's this moment where the city is in such a precarious spot that, you know, do you mortgage your crown jewels to stay alive at the moment, or do you fight for something that's so precious and part of the city's heritage. I start getting phone calls from Le Mans in Paris, Tokyo, art dealers from Morocco. Someone called me and said, I represent a Russian businessman who wants to buy the art, the collection, not a piece of the collection. The artists behind a message about Detroit's bankruptcy that have been very busy lately, putting up sales tags on city property and taking out a full-page ad in the Metro Times. Municipal bankruptcy sets up a kind of bizarro world. Things we thought could not happen actually were happening, like, oh my God, we could really end up losing art out of this? Uh, pensioners could really end up taking a cut? You do not want to go to Chapter 9 if you can ever help it. You can never be certain you're going to get the right cards going the right way with the right people at the right time and place. You're entering a different universe that has its own set of rules. When I heard that the DIA was in jeopardy and it was either they were going to have to sell paintings or we were going to have to take a reduction, I said, we'll just have to give up the art. We made promises to the people who spent their lives working for the city. We've got a generation of Americans who are now saying, this is what you promised me, I need it. And we did not do the things we needed to do to make sure that money would be there. I started with the water department in 1956. If you work for 30 years, you could look forward to health care. You could look forward to a retirement when you're able to send your kids to school and, and make progress and that your legacy is being carried on. I knew that the money was not there. I did not think it was going to impact our pensions.
we came up with a 50-year history that showed how Detroit had basically dug its own grave uh, financially um, by spending too much, by borrowing too much, by promising too much. In the decade before the bankruptcy, the borrowing by the city of Detroit got totally out of hand. I spent the last two years that I was on council talking about we had to do something about the pension debt. We were not making our annual payments to the pension board. There's no money. So the cops, as we called them, they were above the borrowing limit of the city. There were some serious questions about whether or not they were even legitimate, or entirely void, and we don't owe them anything. Our firm does not like to turn transactions down. We were not comfortable that we could give an opinion that this transaction was authorized by law. This structure is illegal. They should never have done this. The counter argument in my mind was always, well, if, if we had never done this, if we didn't exist, your pension woes would be one point, fill in the blank, billion dollars worse. There were four of us who thought it was not in the city's best interest. We were called divisive and, and standing in the way of progress. We're crucified. I was one of the people that thought this was a really brilliant move and was really glad when we got this award from Wall Street. And then come to find out, it then became one of the final links in the chain that led to the city's financial collapse. They were convinced to not have any interest rate risk. So we'll sell you a swap. The primary banks involved, they were UBS and Bank of America. They issued these adjustable rate bonds. You pay us a fixed rate, we'll pay the adjustable rate. Whoever's ahead in that year has to pay the other party the difference. America Patrick's administration took the side of the bet that said interest rates were going to go up. And interest rates moved against the city, and it turned out to be a disaster. The economy of the nation slowed down and those pension deals, that swap agreement went uh, into a deep dive. It was the worst deal that ever happened in the city. And suddenly, the city is owing $50 million a year to pay swaps off to the same banks who perpetrated subprime lending, who got bailed out for their subprime lending. They targeted the city, which was the highest city in black home ownership in the country. We had 65,000 bank foreclosures, almost every one of them based on predatory subprime loans. It shouldn't have been a surprise to anyone on Wall Street that Detroit didn't have any money. Financial institutions were more than happy to keep lending Detroit money. We as a society feel the need to take care of those corporations that were, um, what was the term? Oh yes, too big to fail. If you're a homeowner or a property owner who always pays your taxes to the city coffers, guess what? You aren't big enough. You don't matter. You are not a bank. You are not a corporation. You are not entitled to a bailout. By us filing bankruptcy was an event of default. Appointing an emergency manager, which is what I was, was an event of default. The counterparties has the right to claim a termination, and therefore an immediate termination payment was due. Suffice it to say, we didn't have an extra $350 million lying around that we could have even paid the termination fee. We had tried to get them to agree to a discount and accept a lower amount. It was 200 some odd million, significantly lower than the face amount of the proposed agreement. The following week, Judge Rose rejected that agreement. If it were close, the court would approve it. 
but by any rational analysis, it's not close. It's just too much money. I have to determine whether they are reasonable settlements, and just because the parties agreed to them doesn't make them reasonable. He wasn't pro-creditor, he wasn't pro-debtor. He decided that he was going to speak for the citizens of Detroit. And they, in some sense, were the debtor. Not the government, the citizens. The courtroom was packed every day. Most of the retirees are homeowners in Detroit who suddenly were facing a loss of their income. The pensioners were frightened and angry. We were all in the same room working together on how do we defeat this settlement. Jerry Goldberg would just thunder away. At a time when services are being cut, when retirees are fearing the loss of pensions, to sit back and make a payment to UBS and Bank of America is inequitable and unconscionable. If you owe the bank a dollar, you're in trouble. If you owe the bank a million dollars, the bank's in trouble. The court found the city had entered into a series of bad deals to solve its financial problems. The law says that when the city filed this bankruptcy, that must stop. It also says that this court must be the one to stop it if necessary. I walked out of court and these two pensioners came up and gave me a hug. And I gave them a hug back because they were nice, nice ladies. But I remember thinking, we may both be against the city right now, but we're against the city for very different reasons. Sincora and Fidget were basically saying, raise taxes on the citizens, sell the artwork of the DIA, uh, cut pensions, pay us our money. That this is just a bankruptcy case, we're liquidating, give us our money. A New York City bond insurer called Financial Guarantee Insurance stand to lose big in Detroit's bankruptcy case. They have solicited buyers for the DIA art worldwide and four prospective... Creditors are welcome to take whatever position they want. And, and after reading their paper, uh, the, the ones I'm talking about seem to say, well, we really can't tell unless we have an independent valuation and a market test. Market test sometimes is code word for an auction. If I take an asset worth $5 billion and I give it away for $500 million, normal bankruptcy law says that the debtor can go claw that back so that that money's available for creditors. Because we were representing financial creditors, we were the pariah. Nobody associated with the DIA or really anybody in city government wanted to uh, discuss the art assets or virtually anything connected with the bankruptcy with us. So we did a comprehensive valuation of the collection. Came out with an $8 billion number. So that's the proof to say, look, this art collection, it's just, it's demonstrably worth a lot more than you're getting for it. There was significant interest amongst not only individual collectors, but museum authorities around the world. One of the appraisal experts put a value on the Diego Rivera murals. His proposal was that you'd take a saw to the back of these murals and take them down and pull them out. If there was anything that spoke to the desperation of the creditors in that position, it was that moment. We had several demonstrations at the Institute of Art. If it comes to art and it comes to the pension, you need to think about selling some art. When I was told that it was going to be the rich museum against the poor pensioners, I tried to point out that we were not an elitist institution. We were a museum that was actually loved by the people. If it's selling a piece of art versus a former firefighter not getting a check, this is an easy call. In a lot of ways, the DIA was the bystander who gets clipped by the five-car wreck that comes barreling through the intersection. They were just a museum. The DIA's approach was tone deaf. I thought that the DIA was failing to grasp the seriousness of the situation it found itself in. You can't just say, well, I'm broke, and I can't pay you, and I want to keep all my jewels. 
I'm broke, I can't pay you, I want to keep my furs, I want to keep my house, I want to keep my everything, right? That's not how it works. You don't need a museum to run a city. Museums internationally operate under a code of ethics and selling items within your museum for profit is not allowed. So when we say it would have been the end of the DIA, it would close the museum down. But the value of art versus the value of a person I don't know how that equation works out. If the lawyers and the creditors had taken years to fight about all of the different issues that could have been fought about, there would have been nothing left of Detroit but dust. The DIA was not just going to sit back and let itself get liquidated. It had hired two prominent law firms, and it would be a war. And that could keep the city into bankruptcy forever. The fight over the DIA becomes a larger battle for the notion of the soul of the city. Is a city a municipal entity that simply picks up the trash paves the streets, provides police and fire protection. Is that what a city is? Or is a city something larger than that? A locus of, of intellectual activity, of artistic ferment, of innovation, of entrepreneurship, of uh, culture broadly defined. The media was presenting it as a zero-sum game, either the art or the pensions. I was trying to come up with some way to marry those two. Everybody realized what the problem was. There wasn't enough cash in the system. And the only way to find a solution was to find an influx of cash. I sat down and I tried to just doodle out this idea. Put the art in a trust, lock off the art from all of the other creditors, and give the money to the pensioners. So you say, OK, well, where can I get the cash? He writes down foundations. I'm picking up lunch, and Jerry Rosen is there. And I said something like, I hear you have a big new job. I said, I have an idea I'd like to talk to you about. I was hoping that she could get the foundation community to kickstart the funding. I said, do you know how foundations work? They don't work very fast. Mariam called and said, you're going to get an invitation. Uh, please accept. Judge Rosen articulated, we need enough money to essentially purchase the art out of the bankruptcy. Ford Foundation, Kresge, the Knight Foundation. If we could get them committed, there was a likelihood other foundations would follow. I thought, you know, uh, bio con Dios, go with God. Could you ensure that others would contribute, particularly the state, Detroit Institute of Arts? Can we be guaranteed that if this fund is created, it would not be attacked by the creditors or be attacked by the pensioners? Could we condition this gift on the bankruptcy being resolved? Otherwise, we're not prepared to step forward. I'm a Detroiter, right? So my question was, how do we save the people who had stayed in Detroit all these years, who were still living in Detroit and who couldn't leave? A lot of them were retirees or soon to be retirees waiting on those pensions. I think about the options that they had, uh, they were few. They really needed to rely on the city and the city services and resources to live in. We got a tip that foundation leaders uh, from various places were meeting at Judge Rosen's chambers. Obviously, there was something going on. We had been asked to keep this confidential, but it was a dark, cold, ugly Detroit night, and on both entrances, there had been positioned some reporters. I realized that I had to make a sale here. 
hoped I had to provide them with a realistic path to get Detroit out of the bankruptcy. He said, we are going to need upwards of $800 million to fill the breach here. Does he think that a group of foundations would help bail out the city of Detroit to the tune of $800 million? It would not have been beyond the experience of mankind for people to say, this is a fine idea, we'll get back to you. Don't call us, we'll call you. We're done with the meeting. Mariam Nolan invites a group of people to dinner at our house. What was striking to me as I drove from downtown was just how many streetlights were out. A woman hit and killed on Gratiot Avenue overnight. The streetlights in that area were not working at the time. Elderly Detroiters living in fear. Sometimes I don't know if someone's standing right outside my house or what, because it's so dark. Somebody was shot. They asked who did it, where they run. I don't know, because we could not see where they went. It was people getting to know each other and just trying to understand, was this a serious, real possibility? You've got a huge immovable, intractable kind of problem. We needed to figure out how we could reconcile the competing objectives of securing the future of the DIA and ensuring that the retirees received their pensions. So I offered to give uh, Darren a ride back to the city that night. Alberto said, the bottom line here, Darren, is that if Ford isn't willing to commit, there is no, no deal for the retirees' pensions for the museum, for the city. For this to work, Ford has to come in big, really big. John Gallagher called me because he wanted to understand the story. He explained all the bases that this was going to touch. You had the foundation community, the pensioners, the museum. You had everybody figuring out a way to compromise. And I said to him, well, it, it sounds like a, like a grand bargain. Money began to come into the DIA that we hadn't even solicited. Donors from around the world were sending money. Now everyone understood this really was the moment for Detroit. We were either going to rescue Detroit or the city was going to die. I talked to Darren Walker um, almost immediately after the judges' meeting, and I said, I think it's going to be a tough sell for us if we do not sort of do this in partnership. When the foundation became the largest foundation in the world, Edsel's son, Henry Ford II, decided that it was time to leave Detroit. We weren't as attuned to our roots as we should have been. And that night, his board voted $125 million. Here I am, not even the CEO yet. This request didn't meet any of our criteria and we were talking real dollars. The opportunity to become independent of the city of Detroit. Any smart thinking person would say, let's give it a shot. I remember saying, we'll commit to raise $50 million. I went through the financial statements. I said, Gene, we need to stretch farther. I need to ask you for $100 million instead of 50. I don't know where I'm getting the 50 million. I certainly don't know where I'm going to get the 100 million. But I reached across the table and shook his hand and said, we're in. You have your 100 million dollars. When I heard the grand bargain or the attempt to spin it that way, it made me aware of how much the city was orchestrating a, a PR narrative. Look it. The pensioners will get all the money from the art. We're like, whoa, wait a second. 
whoa, why are we giving the pensioners this money out of the art museum? Why didn't we sell all of that art? The grand bargain didn't represent even remotely the value of the assets uh, in the collection. Uh, this is a multi-billion dollar uh, collection of art. It's about Detroit's retirees who have given decades and decades of their lives devoted to Detroit, whether it's the fact uniform. that they were having celebrations at the DIA where people, there would be public speakers lauding the grand bargain and how great it was and lauding the retirees and lauding the art. There was no way that sentiment and the public reporting around it wasn't going to become part of my ability to win legal arguments that were, you know, tough ones. We fought a PR battle that, in my view, was orchestrated by Bill Noling, who, on a daily basis, were looking to characterize what the emergency manager was doing as positive and everything that the financial creditors were doing as negative. We beat them up every chance we got. We planted stories. We did exactly what they did. These are talking points that are being drilled to the press on a daily basis. The impression that things were going to be moving fast, that these were solutions, that they had the best interests of Detroiters in mind. Don't forget, the governor was vocal in his support. So there was a political consequence to the bankruptcy turning out in a, in a positive way or a negative way. They're doing a victory lap talking about who the heroes of the bankruptcy are. The bankruptcy's still going. And because Detroit is dealing with a prolonged bankruptcy and debt, it's being run by a state-appointed emergency manager, not the mayor. Under that executive, water officials began an aggressive shutoff campaign in March to collect money. There were still 700,000 people living in the city, and they were living through the worst of times. Facing the shutoffs, Kevin Orr had to deal with that the best he could, real time. The poorest citizens in the city of Detroit were forced to actually run water hoses from house to house to share water. You will find that there were neighbors that were actually allowing neighbors to come in their homes and use their shower. I realized the guy was hired to do a job. It would be easy to look at um, him and assume that he had no emotional or personal connection to the city. Uh, but it seemed like he was in a difficult situation, in, in an almost no-win situation. When you're in bankruptcy, it's not like you have great options and terrible options. You have only terrible options, and you have to choose the ones that are going to be least terrible for you. We now seek your support, your courage, and your vote for the city of Detroit retirees. We ask that politics and partisanship be put aside. When the grand bargain was introduced, we were going to fight it. After listening to all the presentations and seeing where the deficits came from and just how deep they were, I didn't feel we had a chance. governor had been saying, no bailout for Detroit, no money for Detroit. So I picked up the phone and I called Eugene and I said, Eugene, it's time to go back and see the governor. I think the state's got to match. Uh, this was not the traditional mediator's role. Mediators don't usually raise money and run political campaigns, but that's what we found ourselves doing here. Now, the political landscape in Lansing obviously was tense, uh, severely polarized. There was a lot of anger. There were representatives for saying, wait, wait, wait a minute. Detroit made their bed, let them lie in it. My goodness, have you seen the kind of corruption that's gone on down there for the past decade? Governor asked for a report on how things are going. All of this foundation money is conditional upon the state participating. But you can't throw up your hands now and say, not my problem. The notion that the legislature, controlled by Republicans, would write a $350 million check to the pension funds of Detroit seemed pretty laughable. 
there are a certain number of residents in the city that will fall below the poverty level that we have to cut their pensions. They're gonna hit back on the state either for Medicare, Medicaid, or state assistance. You might end up paying $3 billion, 10 times what we're asking you for. The state of Michigan had a vested interest in a healthy Detroit. But you know what? Not everyone in Michigan thinks that. And for 50 years, Detroit and Michigan have had a pretty contentious relationship. The state reneged on a promise to guarantee revenue sharing in exchange for cuts to local income tax. The context of that is important because the Detroit electorate feels like we were pushed into bankruptcy. Republican leadership had been relatively disingenuous in terms of any attempts to work with us, so why should we trust them now? Should there be a cash infusion? Should you protect pensions? Should you have an oversight commission? Should you walk away? People had strong opinions. I didn't want to go to war over their intentions. I wanted to stay focused on what was necessary to help improve the lives, protect the lives of the citizens of Detroit. We tried to work with facts. We tried to help people get where we felt they needed to be. He might espouse liberal identity, you know, from time to time, and I may swing the hard conservative uh, hammer from time to time, but we're both reasonable people. A solution has to occur. You know, it was uh, about 50 years ago when I first came to work in the uh, legislature. When I started as a janitor, I dreamed of the day I might be able to be in this chamber and to really represent the needs of people. This is one of those opportunities. This is about the people who live in Detroit, the people who worked in Detroit, and who now need our help. And all we are asking for is a hand up. This is a legacy moment. Somehow, all of these people did what was asked of them on behalf of this larger concept, uh, the city of Detroit, this idea that this city has to survive, and not just survive, it has to be propelled out of this bankruptcy uh, with some momentum toward something better. The emergency manager filed a restructuring plan for the city. Specifically, it's a plan of adjustment and disclosure statement. They're trying to get this plan of adjustment passed, and they need the pensioners to approve it. They needed the approval of the pensioners to say that we agree to these reductions. We'll allow you to take our health care. They staged meetings throughout the city, and, and always saying that if you don't do this, it could be much worse, absolutely much worse. I would have been very comfortable with them saying, no way, we're not doing this. We will, you know, fight to the bitter end and see where the chips fall. I reminded many that I also was taking a cut. I was cutting my own pension and health care and cost of living. You don't take somebody the golden years of their life when they cannot go out here and work, and now you say, I'm going to take or I'm going to cut your pension. No, not today. This is we were very concerned that um, a lot of forces seeking to undermine the plan had gotten out a campaign. Don't vote for it, it's bad for you. You tell any retiree, look, you know, we have $816 million here in hand. If we don't get approval of what we propose to do for it, which is dedicated to you, it will go away. We literally can't put this back together again because we're so far down the road and trying to redo that would be catastrophic for the city. We see cars with microphones, vote no, vote no. Having seen the state of the financial situation of the city, we knew that there was nothing that could be done, there was no help, there was no other money. And to lose 816 million for me was unconscionable. We were able to get 70% of the vote to pass the resolution. The retirees sacrificed income. They sacrificed health care for themselves and their families. 
This was a huge cut, five billion to medical insurance alone to the agreement that you thought you were getting when you retired. It's quite ironic that the city lost its ability to vote on its leadership through the emergency manager law, but then was asked to vote on a bankruptcy resolution taking benefits from its workers and retirees. Democracy is not something that you can give when it's convenient. Democracy is something that should be ever present all the time, good, bad, or indifferent. To make his record in this historic case, he is confirming the plan of adjustment. He says the settlements that are included in this are fair and equitable. And he frankly said there's no more money for creditors in this. He talked about how retirees are getting a special deal. We set aside $1.4 billion that went to blight, police, fire, street lights over a 10-year plan. That's money that creditors didn't get paid. I've never been in a case like that, so, and I don't think very many people have. If you find everybody at a level where they are appropriately screwed for what their position was, then that's probably the essence of a good restructure. They probably all think it's unfair. They shouldn't think that way. It should be sort of an equal level of pro rata pain. There's an old adage in bankruptcy. If you're not at the table, you're on the menu and we needed to be at the table. But Fijic ended up getting only about 10 cents of recovery on its claim. The grand bargain was very diverse constituencies coming together to overcome the cynicism, the dysfunction, to help rescue an iconic city. You know, there's a lot of people who believe that was not fair. We should have gotten more out of the museum and given it to pensioners, or that uh, pensioners shouldn't have had to be at the table at all. But in the end, it's what got the deal done so that the city could get through it and start to rebuild on the, on the other end. But inevitably, the city governments will be faced with a very unpleasant set of choices. Either they cut benefits, they raise taxes, they sell more debt, or they cut other essential services. These policies are not sustainable, and they eventually lead to the same place. So many of those houses that burned have been actually demolished now, and now there's just sort of green fields. I would rather see a green field than a burned house. Detroit's recovery is uh, a matter of perspective. It's bittersweet for people who are still waiting for, you know, progress to, to reach their neighborhood or to reach their family specifically. I would also ruminate, I'm not a politician, I'm not a politician. And one day Bill Nowling just turned to me. He was a little bit exasperated. He says, yeah, you are. You're just not elected and you need to get over it. So otherwise, what you need to do and what needs to be heard will be drowned out. And that's the world in which you find yourselves. Grow up. And I took that to heart. We're told by the end of the day, the power to run the city day to day would go back to Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan and the Detroit City Council. It's time for me now to step back and return the city to the regular order. When you're in the trenches, and you are fighting daily for the life of 700,000 people in a city that is blighted from coast to coast, where children don't have school buses. It is a luxury to sit here and deal with the normative concepts of what is or shouldn't be. It's a different world. I think uh, our expectation in Detroit was that the bankruptcy would save us, not just from the debt, but from the bad decision-making that led to it, uh, from the disinvestment that, that had taken place over three, four, five decades. And then, of course, bankruptcy can't do any of those things. We lost our health care, lost our cost of living, 
and took a cut in pensions. The pensioners made the sacrifice for the city to survive for our children and grandchildren. By no means is Detroit out of the woods. We still have a very high poverty rate, a lot of joblessness. But there's a sense that things are just, we're, we're living in a city that works again. You know, people have seen plenty of the negative over the years. I kind of look for, um, you know, compositions that suggest uh, optimism today, uh, especially as I go out trying to document, you know, sort of this evolution of the city over time. Um, but Detroit has such a beautiful uh, landscape of, of buildings, places, and most of all, people um, that I never get tired of, never get tired of taking pictures here. You'll find out over near Dexter Elmhurst, there's a lady on her block. There are five houses on that block. She's the only one with electricity and water. And what she has on her house is a little sign that says in, in very rickety handwriting, take what you need. That's just indicative of Detroit, that this bankruptcy has raided our bank accounts. But in terms of love and compassion, we're never bankrupt in Detroit. Before I conclude, I want to address the people of the city of Detroit, whose passion for this city is remarkable in its breath, in its expression, and in its unwavering endurance. A large number of you told me that you were angry that your city was taken away from you and put into bankruptcy. I heard you. I urge you now not to forget your anger. Your enduring and collective memory will be exactly what will prevent this from ever happening again. In our nation, we join together in the promise and in the ideal of a much grander bargain. It is the bargain by which we interact with each other and with our government, all for the common good. That grander bargain enshrined in our Constitution is democracy. Now is the time to restore democracy to the people of the city of Detroit.